This is John Nichols of The Nation magazine, and you're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting with Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host, Hannah Feldman. David is a little bit under the weather, so Hannah is filling in. Hello, Hannah. Hello, Steve. And, of course, the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello, everybody. I'm rereading my new book, Let's Start the Revolution, just out, for any of you who are interested. And it's a very deliberate, step-by-step account of how to, especially, take control of Congress. First up on the program, in our continuing coverage of the genocide in Gaza, we turn this time to Dr. Faroz Sidwa. He's a trauma surgeon and medical school professor who has done extensive humanitarian work abroad. Earlier this year, he worked at the European Hospital in Khan Yunus. Dr. Sidwa and other physicians who have treated patients in Gaza have firsthand experience of the devastation and outright horror inflicted on Gazans by Israel's campaign of terror. Dr. Sidwa and 45 other American doctors and nurses who have served in Gaza recently sent a letter exhorting President Biden, Vice President Harris, and First Lady Dr. Jill Biden to effect an immediate ceasefire. We'll speak to Dr. Sidwa about his experiences on the ground in Gaza, this letter to the Biden administration, and whether they have gotten any response. Our second guest, is a business school professor who contends that capitalism, at least in the last 40 years, is not delivering prosperity for the vast majority of people, an observation probably not surprising to most of you. Professor Luigi Zingales is professor of entrepreneurship and finance at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business and the author of Saving Capitalism from Capitalists. Professor Zingales is going to give us a peek into what they're teaching at business school that has made this such a winner-take-all economy. As always, somewhere in the middle, we'll check in with our relentless corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. But first, let's get another perspective on the genocide being perpetrated on the people of Gaza. This comes from a doctor who has witnessed the devastation and treated the victims. Anna? Dr. Faroz Sidwa is a trauma and critical care surgeon, as well as a Northern California Veterans Affairs General Surgeon and he is Associate Professor of Surgery at the California North State University College of Medicine. Dr. Sidwa served at the European Hospital in Khan Yunus in March and April of this year, and he has done prior humanitarian work in Haiti, the West Bank, Ukraine, and Zimbabwe. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Dr. Feroz Sidwa. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Feroz. Listeners should know we're talking about a unique breed of physician and healthcare worker. They go all over the world for a few weeks to the worst disaster areas to help out under horrendous conditions. None of them, in Dr. Sidwa's experience, can compare with what they came upon in Gaza. With that background, Dr. Sidwa and his colleagues have put together a comprehensive letter to President Joe Biden, his spouse, Dr. Jill Biden, and Vice President Kamala Harris. And I hope that they will follow it up with a personal visit to the White House since Joe Biden once again invited the war criminal Netanyahu to the White House. He can certainly spend some time with people who have clinical observations of the massive destruction of civilians, families, babies in Gaza at the present time. Dr. Sidwa. Why don't you describe your experience in Gaza and that of your colleagues? Yeah, absolutely. Gaza is definitely unique compared to anywhere else that I've I've been. The level of violence, the level of displacement, the level of deprivation of normal things that society provides, like even just toilets. Gaza is the only place I've been, for example, that I, I didn't have soap. I literally could not find soap in uh, an European hospital. When it's it's empty now, unfortunately, it was it was forcibly evacuated, but. When I was there, European hospital was the best hospital in Gaza, the best remaining hospital in Gaza. And there was no soap. That's totally, it didn't even occur to me to bring soap because I couldn't have imagined that that was the case. You know, I'm a trauma surgeon, so that's what I dealt with. I didn't take care of medical problems there, such as, you know, diarrheal diseases, pneumonia, things that people are, things that are, are happening. 
happening at a hugely increased rate because of the displacement, the, the destruction of the water facilities and the, the overcrowding and the lack of food. But with the traumatic injuries that I took care of, they were easily the worst I've ever seen. And one major reason for that was because they were primarily concentrated in children. You can imagine just because a kid has a small body, they're more vulnerable to explosions. They're more vulnerable to bullets. One thing that really surprised me, and this was, we made this part of the focal point in the letter that you mentioned, is we were all very surprised on, on our trip to see the, the number and the frequency of children shot in the head and chest that we found. And not 17 and a half year old kids, obviously we're talking about, you know, diminutive children, you know, preteen at that age and younger. I actually, a few journalists have asked me for the journal that I kept while I was there. So I've given it to them and they kept asking, how many kids did you see in this condition? I didn't know. So I went through and counted. And in the 14 days that we were there, really 12 days of actual work, I noted in my journal, 13 children who were shot in that. One of them was shot in the app. That line you could, because you can argue, you know, it, it doesn't, we'll take care of any injuries as, as, we, as much as we can, which was limited, obviously, because of the state of the hospital and the availability of resources. But, you know, it really spoke to me about what the nature of this assault on Gaza was, that we were seeing so many children shot in center mass. You know, that, that's, a, a, you know, Mark Perlmutter, who I met there, and he's become one of my best friends since then, honestly, he's a Jewish American orthopedic surgeon. And, you know, he, he made the point, I think it was on CBS News or CBS Sunday morning or something. He made the point that kids don't get shot in the head on accident. Maybe one, maybe two. You know, you can understand in a, in a, in a war, bullets are flying fine. But every day in a population of 2.2 million, if even one child was getting shot in the head every day in that population, it'd be pretty dramatic. But when we left Gaza, or when I left Gaza, and I started talking to other people who had been at different hospitals, Kamal and Juan, Nasser Medical Complex, Aksa Martyrs Hospital, uh, and, and, and several, I think the Kuwaiti Hospital, for, yeah, yeah, I think somebody was at Kuwaiti Hospital. All of them actually had the same experience. They may not, maybe not every single day, literally, but uh, like, like we did. Because I just assumed that there was some unusually sadistic sniper around European hospitals somewhere, that he was deployed, and that's why we were seeing these kids get shot. But when I, when I learned that it was actually everyone who's been to Gaza saw the same thing, I, that, I was actually pretty surprised by that. So that, that actually was one of the things that made me think that writing this letter was a good idea. You also made a point in the letter about the undercount, that the official total that the media relies on is the Hamas Ministry of Health, which is about 40,000 is a great undercount. You want to elaborate that? And there have been other analyses confirming the vast undercount of deaths, not to mention you, you said almost everybody, the doctors and healthcare workers met in Gaza were either sick, injured, or both. Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, Gaza's entire population is sick. I mean, quite literally. I, I, if you, maybe there's an exception, but I was sick after a week of being there, actually after three or, three or four days of being there. Everybody on my team was sick. And yeah, not, we weren't lethally sick, of course. But the environment is so overwhelmingly destroyed. Everything human-made, everything natural, everything has been ripped to shreds. The massive displacement of the population, the utter destruction of the uh, what's called WASH in the humanitarian sector. It's a uh, well, water, sanitation, and hygiene. That The, the complete destruction. Oxfam just put out a report called Water War Crimes, showing that I think like 90-something percent of Gaza's water infrastructure has been destroyed. The massive displacement and the massive concentration. I think it was UNRWA just put out a briefing saying that 86% of Gaza's landmass is currently under a standing evacuation order, which means it's a kill zone. If you go back there, you're you can you'll be shot at any moment. Even the humanitarian zones, you might be killed. But Israel is announcing that it will kill anybody in 86% of Gaza. That's outrageous to concentrate us this population which was already the most concentrated, one of the most concentrated populations in the world. Like Gaza City had about, had a higher population density than New York City. But of course, without New York's incredible resources, without the height of its buildings, its municipal services, things like that. So to concentrate them on this 14% of Gaza, that's basically a beach. Oxfam has estimated that the people there will have 2.4 liters of water per person per day. And not for drinking, but for all purposes, for washing, for bathing, for drinking, for cooking, everything, which is obviously ludicrously inadequate. It's, it's barely a tenth of what is recommended. And it's contaminated water. And, and yeah, well, on top of that, the water is worthless. It's utterly, it's utterly, it's not potable water at all. And on top of that, there'll be one toilet for every 4,000 people, actually a little bit more, 4,100 something people. That's outrageous. I mean, that, that, there's no way 
in this situation, there aren't going to be huge numbers of deaths from things that aren't violence. So to get back to your point, yeah, what we attempted to do, and this was this was as close as we could come to account, but the, it, without somebody being allowed to go into Gaza and count the dead, which is not, you know, it's being done but from violence, like you mentioned, the, the Gaza Ministry of Health's numbers, but that's only people who get to morgues and media and- reports about people who get to morgues. So it's very, very, it's it's highly inaccurate. It's, it's very, almost certainly a major undercount, even just of violent deaths. But we estimated the number of dead from starvation and starvation-related causes I forget the exact number, but I think it was 40,000. And we estimated a very conservative 5,000 deaths from exacerbated and untreated chronic diseases. So altogether, we came up with a most conservative estimate possible of 92,000 dead so far. But I do want to emphasize one thing. It doesn't, it's, I don't want to say it doesn't matter because obviously every death matters on the but it doesn't quite matter if 40,000 or 90,000 or 200,000 have been killed. What matters is that it's all wrong. There's no reason for it at all. The, all of this could have been solved a long time ago by just ending the conflict. And the U.S. can do that very easily by stopping supplying these massive amounts of armaments to Israel. Literally, you know, every single day is being resupplied and imposing an arms embargo on the entire region. There's no reason anyone should be sending a single bullet, a single bomb, a single fighter, a single vest, anything to Israel or to any Palestinian. All of it needs to be cut off, and these people have to learn to live together instead of killing each other. That's just what it is. In your letter, you make a strong plea for a permanent ceasefire, withdrawal of troops, and letting in the thousands of trucks that are stalled on the Gaza border that are being blocked largely by Israel, and the reinstatement of funding to UNRWA, the decades-long United Nations Relief Education and health organization for the Palestinian people, which Biden cut off U.S. aid at the demand of Netanyahu. There's so much in this letter, listeners, that you need to know about because it's such heartfelt and professionally documented close observation. This short interview cannot do justice to the horrors that Dr. Sidwa and others observed. And they were just there for a few weeks. And then in May 1st, the Israelis cut off the Rafa entry from Egypt, through which these doctors would come for a short period to help out. Now they can't even come in to help out. So the situation of starvation, disease, massive bombardment daily, cutting off electricity, even sometimes internet connection was cut off once for three days, snipers everywhere, tanks everywhere. 1,500 F-16 pilots unloading their bombs and going back home for dinner in Israel. It's a catastrophe that can only be called the Palestinian Holocaust, and it's going to mark the Israeli government that caused it for many a decade. Do you have any things to add, Farouz, about your attempt to try to get Nancy Pelosi and others? She was very critical of Netanyahu's speech, called it the worst ever before Congress by a head of state in American history, to have you and other doctors meet with the president and the first lady. Yeah, I have not made any headway, unfortunately, in that. But, you know, and, and but, I, but I'm going to keep trying and, and so are others. What I think would be entirely reasonable would be for President Biden and Vice President Harris to give us just a few minutes of their time with me, Dr. Mark Perlmutter and Dr. Adam Hamawi who's uh, well-known for a few different reasons. He's a veteran, and he also keep Tammy Duckworth alive after she was injured in Iraq. And he also refused to leave European hospital when the Rafa crossing was taken without all of his colleagues, which was very admirable because I've been... And I know our listeners want to get a copy of this letter. How do they get it? If you have Twitter, if you go to my name, my handle, it's just the little at sign, and then it's my first name and my last name together. So F-E-R-O-Z-E-S-I-D-H-W-A. It's available there. You can read it in the little pictures on Twitter, or you can download it, or they can just message me and I can send it to them. And it's been downloaded in in Israel plenty of times. It's been downloaded in the U.S. about 5,000 times, all throughout Europe, really all over the world, actually. I was kind of surprised by that. And, you know, since the letter has come out, we, uh, meaning me, Mark, Adam, and plenty of others, have had a lot of media inquiries. And, you know, I was on MSNBC for, I think, five minutes. They didn't even bother recording it. And they put like one second of it on Instagram or something like that. But all these little clips are going around. And, and I, I think uh, I'm, I'm hoping 
that we can parlay that into some kind of political change on our side. You know, one of the things that we tried to emphasize in the letter is that we don't have any real, we, we don't have anything to say about the politics of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Like, you know, I don't know if people, I don't know if there's there's going to be a video of this, but you know, people can see there's a map of Gaza behind me. I've been involved with the Arab-Israeli conflict for a long time, but we, none of us really, I mean, some of the, there, there are Palestinians who signed the letter as well. I'm sure they have a preference for the resolution of how the conflict should be resolved. But we, as physicians, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about our own participation in a massive, just unprecedented assault on a civilian population by a military that we fund. We resupply literally every day. We provide the training. We provide the, the diplomatic cover, the economic support. And just everything is coming from the United States. And the, in the end, the Israelis have already decided what they're going to do. They have decided to destroy Gaza if... Half the people there die, oh well. If all of the people there die, oh well. But we don't have to be involved in that. That, that is not, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu said, we'll fight with our fingernails if we have to. Good. You go do that. I don't want to give you any more words. I think you're a psychopath, and I think what your country is doing is insane. And I don't want it to continue. I, and I, and I, I don't think it's even, I can't imagine anybody arguing this is good for Israel either. Yeah, you know, I've lived in Israel. I, I think it's actually a lovely place to be. I enjoyed my time there. I enjoyed my friends there. I still have plenty of friends there. But this can't be a good way for any society to develop and to change. This is all for the worse. In fact, you can see it just in, in, in just Israel's own internal politics from just the past few days, a mob, literally a mob, formed to stop the Israeli military police from arresting, I believe it was nine Israeli soldiers who were accused of gang raping a, a prisoner, literally gang raping him. And a mob formed to stop them from the, the military police finally negotiated with them. They arrested these soldiers and took them to another facility where another mob formed. And this one had government ministers. There were soldiers in uniform participating in the mob. This is crazed. I mean, the, is that what anyone thinks of when they think of a healthy society? It's just outrageous. To bolster that, a UN commission report just came out on the widespread torture of Palestinian prisoners arrested and taken to prisons in Israel without charges, uh, yeah. the daily torture and violence that goes yeah. on. And you don't and have to go to the reported UN. In the UN uh, yeah, you don't even have to go to the UN for this. The New York Times and, this, and CNN already reported on the, I, I, my pronunciation of Hebrew words is terrible, but the Sdei Tiemen prison in the Negev, actually plenty of the healthcare workers that we met in European hospital had probably been held there because they were taken from Shifa Hospital when they were working there, taken, tormented, not fed, neglected, and then finally dumped naked on the side of a road in Gaza. And they all had basically the same story. Yeah, you know, we had a blindfold on. If we moved, we were kicked. We weren't fed. And finally, we were just dumped naked on the side of the road. We had no idea what happened. All they kept saying was, where was Hamas? Where was Hamas? Where was Hamas? And we kept saying, there is no Hamas in the hospital. We've told you this 500 times. And, you know, and I'm, I'm sure somebody decided to say where that Hamas was there so they could get out of the damn prison and torture chamber. Steve? Dr. Sidwa, can you give us a, just to bring this really home to our listeners, a specific anecdote about your experience there? Yeah. If people want more, there's, uh, Mark and I wrote an article in Politico about, about our time in Gaza. There's a lot of details there. there it's kind of hard to read us from what I understand, but but, you know, one that I think illustrative of what's been done to Gaza, not since October 7th, but really since the 90s and maybe before that, there was a young man named Tomer. He was, I think he was 29. This, this so I'll, I'll get to how we met him. But this guy, he's a young man. And if you look at his Facebook page, which I've seen, you can see him with his two young children and his wife. And it's hard for people who don't know the history of the Gaza Strip, especially since 2004. But really, like I said, since the 90s, it's very hard to appreciate how lucky a young man has to be in Gaza to have a wife and children. It's a conservative Arab society and young men don't get married if they don't have jobs. And in right now in Gaza, youth unemployment is 60 percent. So this young man must have done very well in high school because he got into nursing school, went through nursing school and then joined the orthopedic nursing team at Indonesian Hospital in, I think, Indonesia is in Dera Bala, but it was... It's in the north of Gaza. So, and this is one of the the, the large, well-equipped, you know, for a system, relatively well-equipped hospitals in Gaza. 
So then October 7th happens. He's working in the hospital afterwards in November. And the Israelis raid the hospital while he's working. He's in the operating room. He's closing an incision on some sort of surgery. And the soldier says, leave your patient, come with us now. And he says, no, I'm working. I have to finish this case. Otherwise, the patient has to stay under anesthesia. He's shot in the leg in the operating room in his, in his scrubs, in his gown, breaking his right leg and collapsing him to the floor. The Israelis finally leave. And his own team picks him up and puts an external fixator, you know, the metal scaffolding of pins and rods outside of the person's leg. The next day, there's a picture of him in the ward. And he looks fine. He, he's, you know, he's obviously, his leg is injured. He's obviously quite shaken, but he tries to smile for the camera and he looks physically fine. He'll, you know, anybody can heal up from a gunshot wound to the leg as long as it's not. But the day after, the Israelis came to the hospital and took him. And they probably, again, took him to that state team in prison in the Negev, but he, doesn't, he obviously doesn't know where he was. He was blindfolded for 45 days, strapped to a table for 45 days, strapped so tightly, in fact, that when he came in, he had a pressure ulcer, like older folks get on their bottoms from lying in bed, on the back of his head. That's pretty unusual. That doesn't happen. You know, I, I'm a ICU surgeon. That doesn't happen very often. He was fed a juice box every day or every other day. So he lost a tremendous amount of weight. As he became malnourished, his leg became infected and he developed osteomyelitis. It's an infection of the bone. So the bone wouldn't heal. He has pus pouring out of his leg. He's beaten so badly during this time that his right eye is destroyed. And then unceremoniously, he's dumped naked on the side of a road in Gaza. And he crawls for about two miles until some poor person finds him and is like, good Lord, picks him up and brings him to European hospital. Now, we met him in septic shock, confused, terrified of everything, crying uncontrollably, you know, just, just an absolute wreckage of a human being. He's, he's not... He's not the same person. And if you go to the political article, it's, it, there, there's pictures of him there. The last picture of him, which is after we got him better, the last picture of him, he looks like he's 70 years old. He's 29. He's missing his right eye. His limbs are rail thin. You can see all of his bones. You can see all the bones of his fingers. You can, it's horrifying. The external fixator has been removed and anyway, we had to put a cast on his leg because the, the pin sites were infected. And, you know, the fact that they let him go, I, not, not that it would be okay to treat any soldier this way. Like if any American soldier, no matter what crime they had committed, no matter what, we would not accept that treatment from them by any other military ever. We would say they're barbarous for doing that. We would never accept that. And we shouldn't. But no matter what, even if he was in Hamas, that kind of treatment would be totally unacceptable. And the fact that the Israelis let him go proves that he wasn't a threat in the first place. It's just, it's, it's outrageous treatment. I mean, what is the point of treating this young man with a family who used to participate in technical discussions about orthopedic surgery, who used to care for others, and who cared for his patients so much that he refused to leave one of them when a soldier put a gun to his head and demanded that he do so? What is the point of tormenting and torturing and ruining this person? He's a shell of a human being now. He can't even find his family. He has no idea if his wife and children are alive. What was the point of that? How did that make Israel safer? How did that make Jews safer? How did that make the United States safer? How did that do anything other than engender generations long hatred of the people that did it? Well, one answer is that the Israeli military screens soldiers going into Gaza on the grounds of being merciless. They have to be merciless, willing to kill, shoot at anyone, and the ones who show any compunction are told stay in Israel's backup for the Israeli army. So again, the political article goes into great detail, listeners, with pictures by the doctors, as Dr. Sidwa mentioned, and you might want to look at it. I was just going to say, you know, it's, and this is not to not political in any way, but so Mark and I had been sending letters from Gaza to basically every American paper, uh, like from the Minneapolis Star Tribune up. <laughs> like, so not exactly the most widespread press, but we'd been sending it to basically every American paper that we'd ever heard, never once published anything. When we got back, this was at the this beginning of April, uh, I happened to know a news producer at Democracy Now! She and I grew up together. And so she said, you know, do you guys want to come on the program? Said, yeah, of course. So we did. So we had that. Then I was on a, a what I assume is a small, I, I don't know, I hope not offending Jay, but saying that, a small podcast by Jay Kang. He's a New, uh, a New Yorker writer. He also has a podcast. Uh, I forget the name. And so we were, I was on that, and Mark was Mark talked to some local press. That was it. No one was interested. So we wrote a really like a 20,000-word article, 
And I was just expecting to send it around. It wasn't going to be published anywhere. Further, I knew nothing that life could be published, but uh, you know, in a journal or paper. But I expected I would just end up sending it to Common Dreams or your website or something like that, and it would be published there. But when we sent it to Politico, they uh, actually, uh, through contacts, I found an editor who was very sympathetic. And she really fought for the piece. And apparently there was kind of a revolt in their newsroom because the upper levels didn't want to publish it. And they said, no, this piece is good. Like, <laughs> you need to publish this. This is important information. So in an insider publication meant for the DC crowd, this really, I mean, it's a, it's not a, it, it like, it, it doesn't, we, we're, we weren't censorious. We, we said exactly what happened. There's a lot more that we could have talked about. Like you, like you actually, you said at the beginning, Ralph, that the letter is comprehensive. I wish the letter was comprehensive, but it'd have to be a hundred pages long. For the record, with all journalists being disallowed from freely entering Gaza and reporting, including Israeli journalists banned by Netanyahu for years, Here's a first-hand account by many doctors and healthcare workers putting themselves at considerable risk, and it was ignored by the Washington Post, New York Times, Associated Press, Wall Street Journal, and other major regional dailies. So you can put that in your file yeah. <laughs> of deliberate yeah. censorship. Yeah, I mean, it was just, just willful, you know? But then when with the political piece having been published, which, again, is largely due to a very brave editor insisting on it, which I have to give her credit for, and also give her credit for working with me because I know I'm not the easiest person to work with when it comes to this. But since then, Washington Post, New York Times, and nobody's from the Associated Press or Reuters yet. I was on MSNBC for a few minutes, which, again, was just short. They didn't record it. They did, I don't think they tried to put it online, really. But Mark and I were just on CNN International yesterday, and that was shown on PBS, apparently. I don't really know how those things work, but apparently it was shown. And, you know, it was interesting because I was surprised that even on CNN International, the interview was extremely oppositional. You know, we want to report, we want to point out that CNN cannot confirm or deny what Dr. Perlmutter is saying right now. And I kind of want, you know, if I'd been in the studio, I would have been able to argue, but on Zoom, it's impossible. But I wanted to be like, how the hell would you have verified it? They won't let you go in. Like, what are you talking about? Of course you can't verify anything. It's like saying you can't verify what's on the far side of Venus either. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, you can't get there. How are you going to verify it? What are you talking about? You know, it, it's it's weird that they just didn't recognize that two American physicians with no organic connection to the Middle East or the conflict whatsoever as independent verification of what we're saying we saw with our own eyes. You know, it was, it was odd. And one being an Iranian American and another being a Jewish American, Dr. Mark Pullmutter, who and, have gone to other disaster areas together. You want to talk about a human interest story that's neglected here? Shame on the mass media. Things are thankfully opening up a little bit right now, and we're, we're trying to take advantage of that. You know, the, I think the situation in Gaza has reached such a level the political moment in the U.S. with Biden not running again has reached a certain level. And then with Netanyahu's just bonkers address to Congress, and it was one of the most, I, you know, when, when Nancy Pelosi is openly criticizing the prime minister of Israel, he's really screwed up. <laughs> I mean, that's, like, I, I, don't, I don't know, I, I've, I've only been able to watch snippets of it. And I, every, it, it, it's like, you know, every sentence is just ludicrous. You're like, <laughs> what is going on here? And then to see these psychophantic people standing up and cheering, you know, it's like they're like, you know, as if their football team just swore. He got 52 standing ovations from Republicans and some Democrats, double what any American president received in a State of the Union address. Hannah? Correct me if I'm wrong. The letter to the president, I believe, has a very extensive appendix that is I won't say it's comprehensive, but it's more comprehensive. So if anyone wants to get into the details. Yeah, the letter we felt it was best to restrict to our own personal observations because we really felt that that was quite undeniable. But then I also wrote an appendix, or excuse me, we wrote an appendix, really focused on the, the, the publicly available data that bears on the questions that we addressed in the letter, the targeting of children, the malnutrition that we saw, the issues with women's and women and babies, and the likely overall death count just being much higher. Yeah, so that, that appendix is also available. I was shocked. I was sure no one would ever read that because it's dense, it's very boring, 
it's, it's look i won't say i read the full appendix i'm just yeah, saying, but, i'm uh, aware i'm aware it exists the uh but, but well yeah lie. but but i was surprised even that has been downloaded four thousand times so i i was i was pretty surprised by that and i will tell you a bunch of people on twitter because i i try to engage with people i'm not going to engage with somebody that calls me like you know you're you're a hamas nazi or something like that obviously but some people have asked legitimate questions and i've told them you know just just send me a message if you'd like the sources for background for this for that and I, i'd say about two dozen people have so far and i've done that you know it, it doesn't take me very long i know the conflict pretty well and I, i've been surprised by the level of engage of serious engagement you know, again there's a lot of nonsense too but most of the engagement has been positive and then the direct engagement has been almost universally positive so it's good you recognize that appendix and are very important because it includes things like an estimate of a half a million more palestinian deaths in gaza in 2024 Last December, by the head of the Global Health Department, University of Edinburgh, and conditions have gotten worse than what they were in December. And a Lancet letter by some researchers estimating the death toll as of June to be at least 186,000. We're dealing here with annihilation, extermination, yeah, which just, uh, is the core that regard, of the genocidal assault. We're out of time. We've been speaking with Dr. Farouz Sidwa, who just came back recently from Gaza, and with his colleagues, 45 in number, to put a detailed letter with an appendix of documentation to President Joe Biden and Dr. Jill Biden and Vice President Harris, following up with the request to have a delegation from these 45 valiant medical workers meet with the president in the White House. Thank you, Dr. Sidwa. Thank you all. Appreciate it. We've been speaking with Dr. Faroz Sidwa. We will link to his letter to the Biden administration at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Up next, what should business schools be teaching their students? We'll find out after we check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Friday, August 2, 2024. I'm Russell Mokhyber. RTX, the company formerly known as Raytheon Technologies, has set aside $1.24 billion to resolve a series of government investigations into its business practices, including a bribery probe sparked by allegations of corrupt dealings with a member of Qatar's ruling family. That's according to a report from the Wall Street Journal. The sum will cover $384 million in penalties the defense and aerospace company expects to pay as part of a settlement with the Justice Department and Securities and Exchange Commission over the bribery allegations. That probe was sparked by a California lawsuit alleging that RTX had funneled the equivalent of around $1.9 million in Qatari Rial through a consulting firm partially owned by a brother of Qatar's emir. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with Hannah Feldman and Ralph. Our next guest has some pretty strong opinions about what the next generation of MBAs should be learning. Hannah? Luigi Zingales is the Robert C. McCormick Distinguished Service Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. He co-developed the Financial Trust Index, which is designed to monitor the level of trust that Americans have toward their financial system. He is currently a faculty research fellow for the National Bureau of Economic Research, a research fellow for the Center for Economic Policy Research, a fellow of the European Governance Institute, and the director of Chicago Booth's Stigler Center for the Study of the Economy and the State. Professor Zingales is the co-host of the podcast Capital Isn't, and co-author with Raghuram G. Rajan of the book, Saving Capitalism from Capitalists. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Professor Luigi Zingales. My pleasure. Welcome indeed, Luigi. We've been connecting before. You had me kindly speak to your business class, University of Chicago Business School, about my book, The Rebellious CEO, 12 CEOs I've known who did it differently, met the bottom line, but had a different kind of business model. And that's what led us to talk about business schools and the business curriculum and the environment around the country. Uh, apart from your response, there's been very little response from business schools around the country to the good news that is reflected in my book, that there's a way to deal with 
capitalism that respects workers, respects consumers, respects the environment, takes public interest, civic stands. That's what these CEOs did. Like the business schools aren't interested in good news and a framework for evaluating the present behavior or misbehavior of CEOs of giant companies. So with that background and coming from the University of Chicago School of Business, give us your take on business school education, business courses for undergraduates. You have a broader framework for the performance and delivery of a capitalist economy. It has to deliver for its people. And you think the present type of corporate capitalism is not delivering enough for the people. So why don't you take it from there? First of all, it's, it's a pleasure to talk to you again. And I think that the fact that apparently I was the only take your generous offer to talk to a business class, business class, Plus, it made me think about why that's the case, because these days there is a lot of attention, even in business school, about the environment, about so-called social responsibility, about all these aspects. And so why a book like yours did not receive, I think, the attention in business school that deserves? And I think that the answer, in my view, is a bit paradoxical, but is that even business school like to keep separate the social aspect from the business aspect. So. In many places now, there are classes of the social entrepreneurship, which is something very interesting where people uh, try to use the entrepreneurial skills to promote a initiative that is good for society at large, even if not necessarily profitable. And I think this is uh, recognized, encouraged. But then if you are not a social enterprise, then you, you have to be the most capital profit maximizing firms on the face of earth. There is nothing in between. And uh, I think that your book tries to show an alternative path in which entrepreneurs profit oriented, but they're also moral people, number one. And number two, they have often some uh, uh, objective on the side, which is, uh, yeah, making profits, but making something else. And it seems to me that this is really a very interesting paradox because uh, the entire sort of capitalist system, uh, uh, not only in the United States, but in the world, find it difficult to accept these intermediate figures. You either a known for profit or you are an aggressive profit maximizer, very little in between. Well, that's an interesting observation. Another take, of course, is when you look at the curriculum, Luigi, business schools, they're pretty thin on courses on corporate crime and corporate lawlessness and corporate coercion in the marketplace and the influence over government and how they price their services and their goods and how they interfere with family upbringing by direct marketing to children. So why aren't there more courses like that? We notice, for example, in business school libraries, they have exceedingly little material on corporate misbehavior and corporate crime and fraud and abuse. Why is that? Uh, I'm afraid to say it's part of the demand from our students. Uh, you know, business schools, at the end of the day, trade schools that are designed to train people to have a profession and have a business. And we tend to follow a lot what our students demand. And I tell you this story that uh, I've always been interested in the underbelly of business. So, of course, I study fraud, especially after the Enron and WorldCom. And then uh, there was another scandal in Italy, Parmalat, which was at least as large. So I remember that one year there was a management conference and I organized a session on uh, corporate fraud. And I expected a lot of people to show up and, uh, and listen to the panel. In fact, it was a fiasco, almost nobody showed up because they don't want to confront with their own limitation and problems. They want to see the more glitzy and shiny aspect of uh, success. And that's what attracts them to business school. And that's what we end up selling to them. So I think that we are in part responsible because we cater too much to their own demands. Well, you know, they should know, even at their young age, that they're going to be complicit. They're going to be involved in these misbehaviors by corporations. They may be prosecuted. They may be demoted. They're not going to escape it. You see, you'd think that 
they would be interested in finding out about the academic approach to dealing with this when they're as free as they'll ever be to think and not worry about opportunity costs and retaliation against their promotion and their company. It's surprising that the business school professors don't see themselves as sagacious elders telling the students, we know where you're coming from, we know what you want, but we have some added wisdom and experience to supplement your views. And you have in one of the interviews I read of you, Luigi, we're talking Professor Luigi Zingales of the University of Chicago Business School. You said the following, quote, I was looking at the economic trend that in the previous 20 years, capitalism has not delivered an improved standard of living for the majority of the American people, end quote. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. I always thought that the big success of capitalism was when that could improve the standard of living of the vast majority of the population. The reason why we think that capitalists prevail over socialists is not only because guarantees a lot of freedom, but also because economically has advanced the well-being of its citizens in a much more remarkable way. And this has been true up to the early 80s, but in the last 40 years, we have seen in the West this to be much less the case. In a sense, it's not that growth has not continued. We have seen a lot of growth, but the benefits of that growth were disproportionately gone to the upper end of the income distribution with, of course, enormous consequences in terms of uh, political support for the entire agenda. Because if you see the capitalist system as making rich people richer, it becomes a much less appealing system than the capitalists that can deliver a prosperity to everyone. Well, what's interesting is certainly the evidence supports your view here because the top five or one percent are getting a bigger chunk of the income and the wealth of the economy. How much of this do you think is due to the concentration of power in the executive suite in these giant corporations, the ability to escape national jurisdictions and go to tax havens, for example, and the ability to strip their own shareholders? contrary to principles of capitalism, of almost any control over the leadership of the company whose wealth is made possible by shareholder decisions, among other inputs? I think it's complex because certainly what you're saying is, is an element, but it's not the only element. Because let's take uh, other areas where power doesn't play a big role. So once I, for fun, I, I look at the price that golfers win when they, the, the amount of money they win when they, they win a tournament. So take uh, the Augusta tournament, which is a famous golf tournament, and you look at the price that the winner receives over time. And that price started to skyrocket in the 1980s, precisely at the same time as the compensation of CEO started to skyrocket. Not only that, is the difference in price in awards between the winner and the third price also increase this proportion. And to explain this, we have to rely on a theory of a, a late colleague of mine, Sherwin Rosen, that is the superstar economy, that in many situations, when you have a big expansion of the market, you end up disproportionately rewarding the very tip top. So if you are the best player in a small market, you don't make a lot of money. But if you are the best player in a very large market, you make a ton of money. And I think that there is a little bit of that effect uh, everywhere. There is in, in CEOs, there is in lawyers, there is in doctors, there is in soccer players, there is in any kind of athletes, there is in journalists. In a sense, think about Paul Krugman. Paul Krugman now is read uh, everywhere. You go to Italy, you go to Asia, Paul Krugman is read. In 1970, the corresponding Paul Krugman, I can assure you, was not read in Italy and was not read in Asia. So I think there is a winner-take-all nature of the market that has really created a disproportionate distribution of income, creating a lot of social tension. Now, 
on top of that, I, this is not to dismiss that, of course, power plays a role, but I don't think it's just the issue of power. Well, let me take another look at the way some consumer advocates appraise the economy, Luigi. They divide the economy in the needs and necessities of people, housing, for example, health care. Then the second category is wants. You know, they want entertainment, et cetera. And the third category is whims, pretty frivolous stuff that people pay a lot of money for. And we've noticed that from the days of primitive economies, there's been a, a shift in investment and promotion and merchandising from needs to wants to whims. And the needs are being shortchanged. What's interesting is the needs have a lot of corporate welfare or guarantees, government guarantees built in, like housing, for example, and food, agricultural subsidies. Do you ever look at the economy from that angle, the shift of investment and promotion and actually talent, executive talent, away from working in the area of needs, moving to wants and whims? Because I think one reason the polls are showing a decline among the American people in their impression of capitalism is that they look at their needs that are not being addressed. You have 60% of the people in this country living paycheck to paycheck, for example, at a peak GDP time in our economy. What do you think of that trend? Does that trouble you? And, and how would that be reversed? So it's an interesting way to look at, at the problem because you're right that as we started to provide that insurance against inability to satisfy your needs, then we got much more government involvement in the provision of needs. And as a result, we got more government guarantees and less, if you want, upside for people providing it. So the more talented entrepreneurs tend to move into the provision of whims and less in the provision of needs. And as a result, often we find ourselves without enough provision of needs. Think about the shortage of housing, particularly in some of the most rich part of this country, is really a gigantic problem. So I think that we need to maybe create a bit more space for competition in, in these sectors as uh, I'm sure you're well aware, one of the biggest obstacles to the production of houses is the local regulation that protects the current owner and makes it very difficult to expand the housing supply. And the shortage of housing, the extreme cost of housing on the two coasts is the result of not just a shortage of land, but a shortage of permission to build. Well, you know, your comments in one of your interviews that jumped out at me, because I think the last 30 years has been an explosion of monopolistic companies, oligopolistic companies, the new internet companies and their transaction costs like Amazon and Meta or Facebook. You made this comment, quote, first, we need to think seriously about how to make it more difficult for business in the U.S. to be, quote, winner takes all, end quote. Monopolies are bad from many points of view, and a more fragmented system gives more opportunities to more people. That's the reason why I've become much more interested in antitrust, particularly when it comes to the digital economy, end quote. Well, you must like what the Biden administration is doing at the Federal Trade Commission and Justice Department. Would you go much further? Would you expand their limited budgets? Would you update the congressional authority given to them, some of these Antitrust laws are pretty out of date. Oh, yeah, I would go farther. I feel that the Biden administration has moved in the right direction. However, I'm not so sure that uh, there is a, a broad consensus within the Democratic Party to move in that direction. So I feel that Chairwoman Lena Khan has been uh, thrown alone in enemy territory without all the support uh, that she would have needed, in a sense. Uh, as you said, you need uh, a bigger budget for the FTC, you need more power to investigate, and you need laws that reflect the 21st century. In a sense, uh, the antitrust law is, is really ancient at this point, and the problems that we have seen are 
not easily resolvable only through litigation. I think that, uh, for example, I am a big supporter of mandating form of interoperability because interoperability restores competition in sectors where there are strong network externalities. So we today, we don't bother to know whether my cell phone company is the same as yours. Why? It's not because the cell phone companies are nice. It's because there is a law mandating my cell phone companies to take your phone calls and vice versa. And as a result, we have some form of competition, not enough because we have seen uh, too many mergers in this sector, but at least we have some form of competition in the provision of phone services thanks to the interoperability. We could have the same thing for social media, in which I can transfer my social graphs, my friends, to another social media with no problems, and I could sort of receive messages and send messages across social media that will reduce or eliminate the network effect, creating more competition and uh, allowing the creation of companies that are more attentive to some of the problems that consumers perceive in social media. However, there is not enough willingness, even within the Democratic Party, to pass these laws. Because when Biden got elected, the, the Democrats had the House and the Senate for two years, and nothing got done anyway. Now, some critics claim that one of the reasons is that the two daughters of Chuck Schumer, one is working for Facebook and the other is working for Google. So maybe that has something to do with it. But I don't know whether that's the case or something else. But there is not a very coherent and homogeneous response on the democratic side. On that point, Luigi, we've noticed that law schools don't have a course on Congress for the most part. They focus on the executive and judicial branches. Probably business schools don't have a course on Congress. But when I talk to business professors over the decades, I'm amazed at the difference what they say privately about their criticism of big business in our country and what they're willing to say publicly or what they're willing to include in their curriculum is pretty big. What do you think of this self-censorship that goes on? Everybody self-censures themselves one way or another to get through life every day, but it's pretty pronounced in the business school by my experience. What do you think? Yeah, I think that is is a problem and is a growing problem. I think that uh, in part of it is that when the rewards become disproportionately big, I think you have started to do anything to get them. So in when making to the CEO meant uh, you were a little bit richer, then people made some compromises, but not too many. Now, when uh, this is worth, as you said, hundreds of times your current salary, then people are willing to take a lot more, and they do it often in preparation for. So you don't want to be perceived as be critical of X or critical of Y, so you self-censor. And the problem is only exacerbated by social media. So we are at a point in which people are afraid of what they say, Twitter now known as X, or on Facebook or on other sort of or Instagram, because uh, this is visible to everybody. And we now know that uh, you can be fired or you can be not hired if you said the wrong things on, in one of the social media. So the freedom of individuals is really shrinking to a level that I wasn't around, of course, back then. But it seems like the time of McCarthy and uh, the, the Red Scare. Well, you know, part of it is a lot of the prominent business school professors are consultants to big corporations, like is the case in law school. That tends to inhibit candor as well. We've been talking with Professor Luigi Singales, University of Chicago School of Business. One of his colleagues was on our show. He had written an expose of the Delaware Charter Laws that drag charter accountability laws and other corporate accountability laws in other states down to the lowest level. And that's been known for decades by business professors. But he went out and actually did it. And that's just an example of the gap between what business school professors know and what they're willing to talk about and do anything about. Steve? Professor Zingales, you have fresh-faced students come into your school who probably extolled or have been uh, taught about the virtues of the free market. 
And what do you say to them about what we all know really is is a myth that is the free market? How do you approach that? I think that I don't want to sound uh, etymological, but I think a lot has to do with what you mean with free. Because if you mean that free means uh, a competitive market, I do believe that there are a lot of powers in competitive markets. If you mean a market uh, without any regulation, then of course, that's not a market, it's a jungle. And so there is no market without rules. And uh, now the question is to what extent those rules are designed by some sort of market creators, or to what extent uh, they are designed by the political system. But we do need rules. And then the question is, uh, who is better at designing rules? Listen, as we close, give the name of your podcast. I have a podcast called Capital Isn't, which talks about what is working in capitalists today and what isn't, and is uh, co-hosted with Bethany McLean, who is a very famous investigative journalist who exposed the Enron scandal. And we have a lot of interesting people, including we had recently Ralph, and I think is a very unusual and stimulating podcast, if I may say, say so. Okay, that's good. We've been talking with Professor Luigi Zingales, University of Chicago Business School, widely known around the world and widely published and widely relevant to the critique of modern corporate capitalism. Thank you very much, Luigi. Thank you very much, Ralph. It was a pleasure as usual. We've been speaking with Professor Luigi Zingales. We will link to his work at ralphnaderradiohour.com. I want to thank our guests again, Dr. Faro Sidhwa and Luigi Zingales. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up, featuring Francesco DeSantis with In Case You Haven't Heard. A transcript of this program will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Wire Substack site soon after the episode is posted. Subscribe to us on our Ralph Nader Radio Hour YouTube channel. And for Ralph's weekly column, it's free. Go to nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to corporatecrimereporter.com. The American Museum of Tort Law has gone virtual. Go to tortmuseum.org to explore the exhibits, take a virtual tour, and learn about iconic tort cases from history. We have a new issue of the Capitol Hill Citizen out now. To order your copy of the Capitol Hill Citizen, Democracy Dies in Broad Daylight, go to capitolhillcitizen.com. And remember to continue the conversation after each show. Go to the comments section at ralphnaderradiohour.com and post a comment or question on this week's episode. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt, Hannah Feldman, and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Our proofreader is Elizabeth Solomon. Our social media manager is Stephen Wendt. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everybody. Step up, you ought to step up. Rise up, rise up. I know you want to rise up.